All right, David. You're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Do you understand? Why did you record what was going on? I don't know why. This is David Fuller, a former staff member at the Kent and Sussex Hospital. But in a few minutes, you'll see him for what he really is. He sits in this interrogation room in 2021 for a crime that took place in 1987. But that only uncovered his string of abuse that went unnoticed and unreported from 2008 to 2020. Back in 1987, there were two residents in Tunbridge Wells, a town in Kent, by the names of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce. Both were in their 20s, but were not acquainted with each other, other than sharing different bedsits in the same town, and also sharing the same killer. Wendy Nell was 25 at the time, and she had moved into a bedsit following the end of her marriage. It was a devastating blow for her, as she had always been an independent and diligent person, according to her family. One of Wendy's close friends at the time, Julie Monks, recalled the impact of the separation on Wendy's life, as she always strived to create a loving family environment. On June 22, 1987, she had finished her work at the Suppa Snaps around 5 p.m. the previous day, and proceeded to go home after visiting the bank. Following an evening spent at her boyfriend's house, he bid her farewell at 11 p.m. The next day, her boyfriend got concerned when she didn't show up, given how she has a strong work ethic. The boyfriend drove to her flat, only to find Wendy's lifeless body lying naked on the bed, with her blood staining the sheets. Now, despite the thin walls of the bedsits, none of the neighbors had heard any distressing sounds. The autopsy report later confirmed that not only was Wendy brutally beaten, but also sexually assaulted and strangled. It's peculiar why no one in the neighboring area heard anything since it was a very peaceful town. Wendy's father, Bill, a retired bus driver, sadly passed away in 2017 after battling cancer. He once expressed his belief that if Wendy's killer remained at large until his own passing, she would reveal their identity to him from beyond the grave. Just months after Wendy's death, it was Caroline's unfortunate turn. She was 20 at the time, and worked at the renowned Buster Brown's restaurant in Tunbridge Wells. On the night of her disappearance, there were distressing reports of screams from Caroline's doorstep, which raised alarm among the residents. Unlike Wendy, Caroline was not found in her home. Instead, after a three-week-long absence of Caroline, the authorities found Caroline's lifeless body abandoned in an overgrown drainage ditch on farmland in Romney Marsh, located on the south coast. She was found unclothed, save for her tights. By sheer chance, a tractor driver spotted her remains and called the police immediately. The authorities dubbed these two cases as the bedsit murders because of the similarities. But, because this was 1987, there was very little information to go on about. There were no mobile phones for tracking, no CCTV footage of who entered their houses, and the collected DNA samples were inconclusive. Fast forward to 2019, when the advancements in forensic techniques provided a breakthrough. Experts developed new methods to extract DNA from damaged sperm samples, similar to the one found on Caroline's tights. Additionally, they employed a relatively novel technique called familial DNA, which allowed them to determine whether an individual was related to someone whose DNA was discovered at a crime scene. The introduction of familial DNA proved to be a critical turning point. Former Metropolitan Police Detective Noel McHugh, who assisted the Kent investigations and now works for the National Crime Agency, emphasized its significance. With familial DNA, the investigators were able to narrow down the 6.5 million profiles in the National DNA database to a manageable number, eventually leading them to identify the killer. It became evident that unless the perpetrator had been previously arrested for another offense and had their DNA profile stored in the database, the DNA samples collected from the murder scenes would have remained unattributed. The investigative team began examining individuals on the list who had resided in the vicinity of the murders and matched the age criteria. Led by Senior Investigating Officer Detective Superintendent Ivan Beasley, they compiled a comprehensive list of potential suspects, ordered by their proximity as potential relatives of the offender. Through rigorous checks, 
The list was narrowed down to approximately 90 individuals who exhibited close matches. The breakthrough came when detectives identified Fuller's brother, whose DNA showed a partial match to samples collected in 1987. The odds of this match were estimated at a staggering one in a billion. Further collaboration took place between the investigators and archivists at Clark's Footwear because of the footprint found at the crime scene. Together, they were able to determine that a footprint found in blood belonged to one of Fuller's trainers. Photographic evidence from his family album revealed him wearing sports trek shoes during the 1970s and 1980s. With these crucial pieces of evidence in hand, the detectives proceeded to get a search warrant and detain David Fuller at his residence on December 3rd, 2020. David, if you listen to what I'm going to say, yes. um, we're from Kent Police and we're investigating the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Okay? As part of that investigation, you've been linked as a suspect, both geographically and forensically. Okay, if you listen to what my colleagues are going to say to you. All right, David, you're under arrest on suspicion of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce in 1987. Do you understand? Yeah. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. You are being arrested to secure and preserve evidence by means of questioning, so we can conduct searches. So forensic samples can be obtained and to prevent your disappearance. After he was apprehended, the search of his house yielded significant evidence. Detectives found concealed computer hard drives, CDs, and floppy disks, some of which were intentionally hidden from the public eye, like this hard drive here. The police later found millions of images depicting sexual offenses. But in just a few minutes of search, the police put aside the murder case as the evidence showed pictures of deceased women in the mortuaries of Kent and Sussex hospitals, as well as Tunbridge Wells. There were videos of him engaging in necrophiliac acts with the bodies during his employment, and he had handwritten diaries meticulously documenting his encounters with victims at the hospitals. Shockingly, these victims ranged in age from a nine-year-old girl to a 100-year-old woman, emphasizing the breadth of his heinous acts. The search was originally for the murders, but it uncovered the electrician's horrific acts, which became the only thing worth talking about during his interrogation on January 3rd, 2021. Can you tell me what you've been doing? Can you try and explain it to me? Mm. I find it hard. Yes. Thank you. Um, we know that I want to admit that I am admitting the offences, but I don't really want to go into detail. Yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. And what what offences are you admitting, David? As you've just described to me. Okay. In terms of the penetration of yep. corpses. Okay. And do, you, do you know how many occasions, David? No. No. no that, David, I was asking where you put the hard drives, where, where you would have kept them. Can you can you help me where you kept them? You said it was in the office. Now you've got a desk of me in the office. Yeah? And you've got a wardrobe. You can keep quite a lot of your clothes in the office, haven't you? Yeah? Quite a small room. Yes. Now we found some hard drives. It was like packaged to the back of a small chest of drawers. Does it help you, David? Yes. Yeah? Is, is that where you keep the hard drive? Yes. Now, after the detective informed him why he was being detained, he knew there was no way out. His silence echoed through the room. And while he's struggling to reveal everything, the detective maintains a calm and clear stance as a confession may come naturally. Okay. The second part to this, David, is the recording, isn't it, of, of what's been happening, okay? And we'll have to go through that in a little bit more detail, but just for now, David, all right? Just for now, all right? When, when that's been happening, okay, all right? Have, have you been recording yourself doing those things? 
recording yourself you penetrating the corpses. Yeah. Okay. What did he retain the recordings for? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Was it for virtual pleasure, David? You know, in the same way as somebody would keep. Yeah. Not the time shots, but the Kansas Sussex hospital a couple of times, yeah. And it started then. So it started then. Mm. Okay. And you say a couple of times. How, how many would you say? Mm. Not many. Sorry, not many. Not many. No. Not many. No. Okay. And <coughs> in terms of the Kenton Sussex hospital, um, were there any occasions other than at those hospitals? No. Okay, so it's always just been a hospital setting. Yeah. It's not been at any funeral parlours or no. anybody that you knew that had died or anything like that. Okay. Do you know why you started? No. Do you remember the first time? Remember the first time? No. Okay. Now, he claims that there were not many victims, but according to the hard drives, there were four million images of abuse found. Now, while most of them were downloaded from the internet, some were recordings of fuller abusing bodies. Keep in mind that he had been working in the hospital since 1989, and his horrific routine was that he'd wait for the mortuary staff to finish their shifts, after which he'd access the fridges containing the bodies. All of his recorded abuse took place between the 31st of December 2007 to December of 2020. Did you record who they were in any details on, on the hard drive? Did you? Did yes. You? Oh, okay. Sorry. Did you record their names? Yes. Okay. Did you record their ages? Yes. Okay. David, this is probably the hardest question. All right. Well, the hardest one for you to answer. I always try and feel comfortable answering it. What? Why did you record what was going on? I don't know why. He recorded himself abusing them. He recorded their names and age. And he's got a hard drive full of images of abuse. Of course he knows why. We're not siding with him in this situation, but he's actually being smart by not confessing. By admitting his intent, he'll incriminate himself, and his attorney will have the impossible mission of getting him out. But at this point, his hard drive is all the more proof there is for him to serve life in prison. Yet, he's still trying to reduce those chances. And I can help you, because you, you know we've, we've searched your, your office, haven't we? And we've seized your office, and we've downloaded computers. I don't know, David, whether certain things in your life have given you the opportunity to do it. Can you see where I'm coming from? That could be a particular shift. It could be a particular day when the mortuary closes early. Um, it could be something else in your personal life that allows you to, to do that. Or, or there may not be a, a sequence. It might just be when one of the females enters the mortuary. What was your, what was your thought process? about your offending, David. How do you, how do you um, decide that a particular offence would occur? I mean, you know, is it? I didn't have a particular... Because the detective's string of questions about his abuse is met with a string of I don't knows, the interrogation came to its natural end. All this started with the familial DNA that tied him to the crime. But now, in his trial, he had to give a better answer than I don't know to abusing over 100 deceased women and murdering two. That's right. Mr. Michael Bisgrove, the prosecutor, said, quote, The indictment reflects the course of conduct by Mr. Fowler during his employment at two mortuaries, during which he systematically and repeatedly abused the bodies of dead women and girls. He abused at least 101 women. In the trial, it was also revealed that he continued his abuse till his arrest in 2020. Some testified to him abusing even hours before his arrest. This was the case for one of the victims whose daughter spoke up and said, quote, David, I want you to know how much damage you've caused, how your sick and twisted behavior has damaged families like mine. I'm pleased you're now being held accountable for what you did only seven hours after she died. She said her mother did not want to die in the hospital, and the family declined a post-mortem examination because she had been subjected to enough quote-unquote prodding and poking during her illness. The brother of another victim said, quote, He has caused complete and utter devastation. David Fuller has tainted every single memory I have of my sister. All I can think of is what he did to my sister when she was supposed to be resting. 
The judge presiding over the case revealed just how depraved this monster is by exposing the hard drive that carried his monstrous acts. The systematic nature of the way you had recorded your offending can be illustrated by reference to one portable hard drive that contained three folders, Necrolord, Register, and Deadly. Some of the content could not be accessed. Deadly was a subfolder titled Deadliest. This also contained subfolders. One of subfolders titled 00 Best Yet contained a further 36 folders. Of these, 27 were titled using a number, then a woman's name, and then a further number. Within these folders, you stored images of you interfering with the corpses of women and girls. It is by looking at such images, comparing the creation dates and other records with the mortuary logbooks and other evidence that the identities of the 91 named victims were found. In 2021, Fuller was convicted of the murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce after the DNA sample matched his. He was sentenced to a whole life order, which is the British equivalent of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Later the same year, he was charged with an additional 16 offenses committed at mortuaries in the now closed Kent and Sussex Hospital. Finally, in 2022, David pleaded guilty at Maidstone Crown Court to the following. Two counts of murder, 32 counts of sexual penetration of a corpse in respect to 32 individual victims, one count of sexual penetration on a corpse as a group charge in respect of 27 victims, eight counts of taking indecent photographs of a child, three counts of possessing an extreme pornographic image, three counts of making indecent images of children, one count of possession of an indecent photograph of a child, one count of possession of prohibited images of children, one count of voyeurism, and one count of possessing an extreme pornographic image. He is now imprisoned at HMP Franklin, a maximum security prison, spending the rest of his years behind bars, where he's away from committing any disgusting act ever again. Just think for a second about how innovation in DNA technology was enough to bring this madman into custody. And once his house was searched, the true depth of his criminal acts was revealed. It is shameful how he went on for 13 to 15 years without a single report of his necrophiliac behavior, but we're glad to see that justice got served after all. This was the horrific case of Britain's most prolific sex offender, who got caught after 34 years. And as always, thanks for watching.